so these uh, my friends and uh, and colleagues these are the lectures which have been planned in this during this world quality month so we had this session by mr dr lars scorquist on uh, 4th november today we are having this by uh, dr subramanya then the next one is on 18th november which will be taken up by mr k kanyappan uh, and the last one will be on 25th which will be taken by mr sandilya so these are the uh, quality month lectures on every saturday the indian society for quality is organizing these sessions to enhance the understanding and knowledge of various participants across these sectors so this as i spoke uh, is the biggest event of the year which is being organized by indian society for quality so this is being uh, the annual conference uh, with the theme of making indian manufacturing a hallmark of quality in the world so this is uh, to be held from 30th november to 2nd december at jamshedpur so that is another uh, mecca of manufacturing i would say where the indian manufacturing actually sprung up so this is the place that we should go and see how things are being done uh, right from the tata group companies as well as other organizations which are working there in and around the industrial sector so this will be a three day conference which will start off with a pre conference seminar on 30th november which will uh, wherein one will be taken by mr anil sadev Uh, sorry mr m ramnathan and uh, the other will be taken by mr anil sadev and Pank, uh, dr pankaj kumar then we'll have multiple sessions by senior leaders across the organization and on the uh, second day on the third day rather there will be a plant visit to tata steel and tata motors so this is the uh, program in in uh, a summary in a synopsis uh, of the entire uh, events that are planned uh, i would request all participants who are present here to come over and witness this event which is one of a kind event where all quality professionals get together and discuss their thoughts and uh, vision for the way ahead so that's it for now with this i'll now hand over to mr chandramouli who is the president of bengaluru chapter to formally introduce our speaker of the day uh, dr subramanya over to you uh, chandramouli sir thank you kunal hope i am audible yes sir you are audible okay. it's a privilege uh, not talking much let us directly get into uh, understanding our faculty uh, my first sincere thanks to mr janak mehta and mr ramnathan to bring in uh, fantastic speakers into this quality month not only during quality month and also during various events uh, we had uh, eminent speakers like uh, uh, dr pedro saraiva then Dr. Rajivil, and then we had Dr. Lars uh, Sorfest, and now Dr. Subramanya. So it even even difficult to identify and know these faculties, but we are uh, lucky because we have this fantastic support of our GC, especially uh, Mr. Janak Mehta and Ramnathan sir, to identify these great speakers and bring them on board. So today we have Dr. Ken Subramanya. Uh, I'm a little bit selfish and also proud to say that he comes from the same region. uh speaking my late native language and also has done the industrial and production engineering like me so there were a lot of personal connect but um, apart from that uh, let me tell you that he is currently working as a principal of rb college of engineering bengaluru uh, he has done his mtech in industrial management uh, and mba and hr specialization and he also has a phd in supply chain management he has a total of 30 years of experience in teaching training and consultancy He is also a very active uh, involver in research and administration. In the field of academia and research, he has done a fantastic contribution in terms of uh, providing his expertise uh, to in the areas of operations management, supply chain, and logistic management. While uh, he is also modern on the e-enterprise modeling, simulation modeling, and so on, uh, he is well supported, and uh, he has guided more than hundred. UG and PG projects, and uh, this is also backed up with uh, alliance with uh, institutes, academic institutes, various academic institutes like IISC, IIT, Kanpur, and so on. Uh, he has a MOU with uh, at least 15 uh, academic institutes, and he has signed MOUs with almost 120 industries, manufacturing, service, and so on. Uh, and he also has got funds for some for, for some of the projects where his students are uh, really. Uh, benefited blessed i would say uh, with not only knowledge but also financial assistance from the rb college of engineering university and also the um, other organizations this way he has made a, a good dent mark 
He has published about 150 papers and is referred in national and international journals and conferences. He has authored and chaptered in uh, chapters in 100 books or 10 books and filed two inventions which are in the final stage and executed several funded projects, as I said, and the consultancy assignments and coordinating the projects. And he has also provided uh, the funds to the tune of 18 crores in the last three years, 18 crore Indian rupees, I mean. And he has implemented the National Education Policy 2020 framework. And he also has established 26 centers of excellence competencies at college levels, including industry practitioners. He's instrumental in signing uh, MOUs with various organizations and universities. And uh, the important is not only just signing the MOUs, he sees the, he sees the completion of the projects and helps students in uh, publishing those papers and making them uh, real. And conversion of ideas into reality is uh, the favorite part of Dr. Subramanya. And he's a member of uh, various statutory committees, both national and state level, serving as member of more than 10 professional collaborative works and networking. His hobbies include listening to music and playing cricket. Apart from this, Dr. Subramanya is a very approachable person. Uh, he is very busy, but he always has time. You can call him. And uh, he has at least 50 WhatsApp friendship groups. So he is still active with all the friends, right from childhood friends till the professional friends. So uh, people wonder how he really finds time. But I'm really glad that whenever I called him, he, he received the call. And uh, he was very much willing to be a part of ISQ. And his uh, fame rose uh, quickly and his involvement was too good. So I'm also very glad and uh, congratulate him once again for being the member of the governing council. We are proud that uh, from Bengaluru chapter, we have a person also in the GC. Uh, expecting more and more from Dr. K. N. Subramanya, not just stopping at the students chapter. Uh, we'll see more in the years to come. And he's also the designate uh, president of Bengaluru chapter. So wish him all the best of energy, health, enthusiasm, and uh, friendship with all of us. So we are highly privileged to listen from you, Dr. Subramanya, today. And over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just uh, give me a minute time. I think uh, somebody has to allow me to. You are not able to share. You are not able to share because you are allowed to share. Not, I am not able to see my file. No, but you are able to press that share button. Yeah, now I, now I am ready. Okay. Am I getting now? Now we can see that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we can see. Okay. So, uh, thank you. Uh, I thank all of you. I think for nice words and uh, I mean uh, standards of quality today and. Uh, my presentation would be on the higher education and quality. And if any point of time, I think somebody is not listening, I think you can uh, uh, just inform me. Uh, so let me uh, start uh, uh, dissecting these words, quality and higher education. First education, then higher education, then come to quality. Uh, so my presentation uh, will be, some things would be academic in nature. Some things would be, what are the practices we have done in the institution? Uh, taking the need of the higher education. So as you know that uh, quality is one word, even though many people try to define it, uh, but according to me in education, if you look into it, uh, I think uh, Sri Aurobindo has told sometimes back. Uh, so education itself is a holistic development of mind, body and a soul. And he believes that education should inculcate in a student moral values, humanity and character building. So integral education transforms a man to Superman and awakens his consciousness. I think this is the main purpose of education. And as uh, the days have progressed, I think while uh, looking into the changes which are happening in the world, uh, many of these things uh, might have become relative, but I think it should be taken in an absolute term, whether whatever could be the generation we are talking about. I'm sure that the later part of moral humanity and the character building has to happen more in the younger generation I think that's the main job of uh, education institutions, according to me. 
So in line with this, I think a lot of education policies have been done in the country, but the latest being uh, the National Education Policy 2020. So if you look into this, I think it envisions an India-centered education system uh, that contributes directly to transforming our nation sustainably into an equitable and vibrant knowledge society by providing high quality education for all. I think this uh, high quality education is very important. That is where we can try to link with the, whatever the quality issues we talk about. Because higher education is there, quality higher education is a very, very important term. Because uh, so many institutions have mushroomed over a period of time. And uh, is there anybody who is looking into the quality of this education? Uh, there are some bodies which I'm going to tell you. But with all this, there is a lot of scope for improvement in terms of the quality. So this is the vision. Uh, I will keep this as the focus uh, for the uh, quality in higher education. As a part of that, again, uh, just the education part of it, it need not be always. There are certain principles that are set. So to develop a, a good human beings capable of rational thought and action, and they should possess compassion and empathy, courage and resilience, scientific temper and uh, creative imagination, sound ethics and values. I'm sure all these things, one way or the other, is a part of the quality which uh, people talk about. Either it is the industry, a service sector, an academic institution, or an NGO, whatever could be. I think these all the things, if I can do for an younger generation, I think I'm meeting the quality requirements of higher education. Also, to producing engaged, productive, and contributing citizens for building an equitable, inclusive, and plural society as envisioned by our constitution. So we are also had to govern by some things, which is the constitution. I think this is the fundamental principle. I'm sure that uh, this very well goes with the quality principles, whatever we talk about. And uh, uh, that is on one side of the education. I'm sure people are all working in quality, know about uh, this slide very well. I will not spend much of the time, but I'm sure that parallel to this, whatever has happened, even the education systems are also keep changing. I think that is the focus I wanted to take here, that uh, you started the quality definition of satisfactory to the customers, then started from the fitness for use, conforming to requirements, then product user instruction for use, then what the customer says it is, then conformance to procedures and uh, specifications by ISO 9000. So obviously, I'm sure uh, I can go on relating one by one here. Uh, still, there is a question today, uh, who is a customer for an education institution? So uh, I don't classify student as a customer, actually is a part of a process because we come under service. So obviously he's an internal customer and our external customers would be obviously higher education institutions or could be the companies. So obviously whatever is expected by the companies and the higher education institutions or the startups or any other mode of uh, employment which is given to the student, I think I'm supposed to meet their requirements. I'm sure over a period of time, these things have also have correspondingly changed in the education system. And uh, I'm not going to the details. I'm sure that uh, uh, people know about these things. But the last one is very important for me. How do you do that? Uh, maybe it could be the statistical uh, uh, tools or could be the diagnostic and remedial journeys and 14 obligations uh, from Demings or 14 steps from Crosby and nine M's from uh, Fugenbaum. And of course, uh, ISO 9000 has a lot of guidelines, even for education, ISO 9000, many institutions have taken. So I'm sure parallelly the higher education is taking care of the quality issues, but it could be in uh, different terminology. They may not use the same terminology here because we are dealing with uh, more of the human rather than more on the machines here. So in that way, the way you have to view quality for a education institution will be slightly different in terms of the words. I'm sure uh, people in the higher education have taken care of that. Then uh, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are participating here who are academicians. I'm sure these tools are very, very common in industries in the operational level. But let me tell you, many of the uh, students or the faculty may not know about uh, the names of these tools, but day in and day out, we use all these kinds of tools because we are also answerable to a lot of statutory bodies. We are supposed to uh, produce a lot of our documentations and we also have to see the performance of our institution. Obviously, all these tools are making use of. Uh, maybe my to my academic friends, you can try to know what are these names which are called in quality and whatever uh, the diagrams you are drawing, you can try to relate it to this because uh, this is the fundamental tools of quality 
the seven qc tools and the seven new qc tools which are in the, which are extensively used in almost all the all the organizations they use but uh, even though we use this in academia we may not call this by these names that's i think that's the only difference i wanted to highlight here that's why i put this slide otherwise we do check sheets we also do cause and effect diagram because a student fails in the examination i think that is the effect we are seeing cause could be something different so i think uh, definitely we use day in and day out but we may not do a right kind of a chart here but the mental calculation happens in terms of the cause and effect diagrams of course histogram pareto charts are very very common uh, for all the kinds of our statutory requirements also we try to do it and control chart is the one which you can look into our results analysis the admission process whatever we have we can use this control charts scatter diagram and again stratification looks into the admission pattern the geographical location of the students or could be the results so there are many factors where these tools have been uh, effectively made use of Uh, so this is another link i can try to create between the higher education and the quality tools whatever we have obviously so we have moved from a quality to quality control to quality assurance to quality management i am sure that uh, even in education this kind of a focus is there maybe in the later slides i am going to show you how these principles have been adopted even in the institutions these are the seven principles of total quality management on the customer focus leadership on the governance is other one engaging engagement of the people it in fact this is very very important for me because uh, we have different stakeholders in the whole of the education system it could be in terms of uh, the parents the students the faculty the management and the statutory bodies the general public at large are all the stakeholders of education and uh, we definitely engage with them at different points of time and uh, there will be lot of variabilities in all these uh, when you want to take a decision making and obviously processes i am going to explain after some time then obviously continuous improvement is there my result improvement the admission quality improvement my placement improvement i think all these are a part of the whole process in the education system and evidence based decision making is obviously the proof uh, the kind of activities which we do has to be definitely evidenced in fact uh, education field is one we'll have lot of documentation which keep doing uh, we have to address only at least in higher education 9 to 10 statutory agencies every year i think almost 7 months in a year i spend only on this uh, meeting the requirements of the statutory committees where this is the evidences plays a very very important role and obviously when you are engaging with a variety and a heterogeneous people i think relationship becomes very important if you take uh, rvc or we call it engineering i have 7000 students and i have 15 undergraduate and the 14 post graduate programs and the students come from uh, different uh, states in the country some come from the other countries also The, then we have all these kinds of a relationship system dynamics have to be played into i have a rural students i have an urban student i have the girl students and the boy students and i have a different heterogeneity of the states there is a lot of diversity you know the relationship management becomes very very important i think this fundamental uh, tqm tools are very very important and it is a continuous process i, I don't think i don't consider this as a steps i consider this is a continuous process as long as the institution exists i think there should be an improvement uh, which we have to make that is in fact the quality focus is on that a continuous improvement should be there in whatever activities we do so then uh, let me also look into the if you are looking at the educational transformation uh, do you think we are doing things in isolation no actually the driving forces for us is definitely the industry and the society disruptions if i don't take care of this and do my syllabus or the scheme i don't think uh, my student would be employable so obviously the kind of digital transformations which are happening the grand challenges posed for engineers by america then vision 25 35 document i am not going to details maybe i can send all the information regarding this vision 25 35 documents is uh, what we, uh, what india has to become in all the sectors of economy this is a beautiful document done by tifac and it tells us what all the technologies india has to focus into we already seeing some uh, changes happening because of this vision document anil kakodkar was the chairman of the committee and he has uh, interviewed almost on 5000 scientists and engineers in the country sometimes back and the document has been done i think for an engineer if he has to work for the india centric issues this is a beautiful document as you know the sustainable development goals is the order of the day for every country in the world and in fact uh, there is a lot to be done in the educational transformation with regard to sustainable development goals what are the technology we are talking about in industry 4.0 and 5.0 along with quality 4.0 i think uh, uh, it should be linked with whatever the education which is happening 
and of course in some part of the country startup culture is also there i think this is driving our education today i think the kind of the my customers requirement in the outside market is all these things and if i don't take this as a part of my uh, curriculum or the transformation in a student i don't think uh, my students would be wanted by anybody so that is one driving force another driving force do you think in education uh, now things are not happening because whenever i meet industry people they say that we are lagging and uh, we have to improve a lot what has been taught in the class is not helpful to the industry i think these are the things which have been uh, listening for quite some time i think there is a lot of blame game between the industry and education for more than 2 to 3 decades but now i don't think that should happen because according to me industry and uh, academia are the two faces of the same coin if we don't uh, work together as the developed countries does i don't think we can achieve any of the goals of sustainable development vision 2035 getting more startups is not possible so even in the uh, education field we have a uh, national education policy which has been done after 35 years and it has given a huge uh, it is a 60 page document final document and 400 pages uh, uh, detailed document whereas uh, i was also a part of this nep 2020 as a uh, some contribution to the document also then i am going to tell you something about education 4.0 because this 4.0 4.0 5.0 has become common in every field actually so even in education we have 4.0 and 5.0 i'll touch upon that after some time then accreditation and ranking in fact if somebody is talking about quality in higher education i think this accreditation ranking agencies are very very important for us because at the end of the day they are going to benchmark against the best institutions in the country and tell us where do we stand i think that uh, dictates the quality for us and where do we stand and where we have to move and uh, outcome based education is one because uh, maybe more than 300 years our education has been a rote learning and the memory based learning and uh, people feel that there should be some changes based on the outcome whatever you studied is in a position to put into practice so i am going to spend some time on this also on the outcome based education and world economic forum has done what are the 21st century skills needed for engineers and managers so that is another change which has happened based on which we have to go back and set our syllabus then employment and higher education is another one which uh, has to be enhanced among the younger generation so this is the educational transformation which is happening obviously when uh, the transformation is happening in education and industry uh, we should also resort to innovative strategies what is this all about because we are dealing with generation x y z in fact we have completed with all the english alphabets and we are moving into uh, uh, greek alphabets also gen alpha is already there actually i think gen alpha is going to come to higher education maybe in another 15 years so people who are born after i think 2010 onwards and 2020 onwards i suppose 2015 onwards sorry 2015 onwards they are all in primary education now and they will be coming to the higher education in another 10 years so what should be my mode of teaching is it the same way what i was teaching 20 years back i have to teach or is there any way we have to do it there is a lot of digital transformation which is happening and the technology adoption has to be done then today everything is interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary in nature so how do i inculcate these things into the education system is a challenge or a driving force for us and obviously learning style of a student is very very important i am going to spend a little bit more time on these things after some time and obviously teaching learning methodology is a core based on the innovation strategies also where in the active learning the experiential learning skill developments and the centers of excellence these play a very very important role to have teaching learning process and uh, the research so i think this slide is very very important for me because in the next 20 30 years whatever the education happens in the country particularly the higher education in particular engineering no i think this slide becomes very very important and if you don't try to connect the dots here i think we'll be working in silos and still the blame game goes on for a long time so can i view supply chain because i'm from a supply chain background i'm sure that uh, uh, people in industry know what is supply chain all about and uh, so for my academic uh, colleagues let me tell you that uh, all of you have come, come through in a supply chain model have a source make and deliver i think i have delivered that the make is generally for a product that i replaced with service okay this is an education model i think this has been visualized by me based on a little experience i have in this sector i thought let me put it as a, a supply chain model which is process oriented and uh, i am sure that quality is a factor everywhere here 
I think you can put the everywhere QQ in every block because whatever activity I do, quality should be an inherent characteristic in all these processes. So if you take education as a service, the, for me, what is most important is my supplier. I'm taking this as a supplier uh, model and uh, see, tier one suppliers are my plus two ICSC, CBSC kind of students, undergraduate and postgraduate. So what is the quality which has been given in the country for these people is very important for me. And who is going to join my college is very important because based on that, all the other things depends on me. And for that, I think uh, supply, tier two suppliers would be SSLC, ICSC and the 10th standard students would become the tier two suppliers. Of course, for that, tier three, tier and suppliers would be your primary education and secondary education is going to come. So like that, just like you talk about suppliers in the uh, manufacturing setup, I think I'm sure that this is what is very important for me. And obviously the stakeholders play a very important role. The students, the parents, faculty and the staff, statutory bodies, government, management, suppliers, industries, universities and the media. I think these are the straight influencing factors in running a higher education institution. So what happens? These people will uh, join. I think the admission process is very important. I think uh, if you say the how do you evaluate uh, the quality of an institution depends on the kind of students who join the institution. That is where the quality is taken into consideration. So from there, you move to the admission process. So when once he joins, then the whole the internal process of the organization is going to start. Whatever has been uh, put in the red color are all the direct line functions according to me. Like say curriculum design, planning, design and delivery, then uh, uh, interdisciplinary research and innovation, industry connect and consulting, accreditation and ranking. These are the core processes according to me, uh, which a student has to go through this so that uh, student and an institution in turn has to go through this to get a better delivery or the outcome. And of course, uh, will it happen just like that? Like in companies, we also have other support functions. So one could be the infrastructure and maintenance, other could be the governance and the administration, there would be the marketing and the media planning is the one on the one side. The other side is the financial management and the HRM and the development. HR plays a very, very important role. Let me tell you, the kind of HR development which has to happen in an education institution is much more than an industry because here we are doing a human transformation, uh, which is very, very difficult. It's not just like making a, a mobile phone in the shop floor because the transformation a student uh, from a no voice to a learned person has to happen. I think the human resource development occupies a very, very important role. Obviously, student support system, if you want to make student uh, a congenial atmosphere, you have to also give a holistic education to him. Student support systems play an important role. And finally, when once the students pass out, I think they are alumni, we'll have a global connects so that uh, we can uh, always try to work with the best benchmark institutions in the world. So this is the kind of processes which are involved. Maybe uh, throughout my presentation, we'll also be seeing like, uh, what are the kinds of these things done in the accreditation, the ranking framework also? The terminology could be different in different uh, circumstances, but the main idea has been given in this, how the whole process approach, oriented approach in education happens. Obviously, delivery is what? It is totally my outcome. I, I don't even call it as a delivery. It is an outcome of an education institution. One is, I think students are going to join if the placement is very good. I think many people say that, okay, a placement is not my job but actually let them take out the placement and see how many are going to join the institutions. So obviously placement is one of the very, very important factors because uh, we have a total heterogeneous setup who wants to economically become stable in the beginning. Obviously placement becomes important to meet their aspirations. Students also go for higher studies. Maybe if I, my whole system is very good, they also get uh, higher studies admission in the good universities in the world. Then you have uh, a culture of uh, incubation and startup even though the culture has started now, I'm sure that in a, as of now, the percentage of students who go for a startup may not be very much. It may not be even one to 2% in an organization or individual institution, but I'm sure that these people can make a mark after going for placement, then also they can do the startup or directly they can do the incubation of the startup. And the many institutions, good institutions in the country have a provision for incubation startup in the company, in the institutions itself. And obviously, other uh, most important aspect for the long term to meet is the community development. As you become uh, more educated, I think we have more responsibility to give back to the society. 
in whatever way too. I am sure that this is a very important model for me for the higher education, and uh, I am sure that uh, this, based on this only, all the things have to be done at least in the next one decade. I have taken almost all the aspects of uh, the national education policy and the requirements in the industry. Everything has been taken into consideration, and this is a model which uh, we are following in the college. It is not a hypothetical model. It is a model which we are exactly following in the college. I am sure many good institutions in the world will also have a similar kind of a model. So I am sure uh, we are through with the supply chain management model. And uh, every activity, whatever you do here, quality is an inherent characteristic, according to me. So, uh, can I, whatever the managed supply chain I put it, can I also put it into form of a quality framework? It is possible, actually. So, one is, uh, as far as you take over the quality framework of higher education, first one is accountability. Because uh, we are accountable to all our stakeholders, just like uh, the companies are also accountable uh, to uh, your stakeholders. We as an institution are also accountable to the stakeholders for the optimal use of the resources and delivery of accurate educational products and services with zero defects. So the zero defect is still a, I don't say, because if I just give 100% result uh, uh, to the people, I think they suspect the quality. Maintaining the quality, if I can give uh, zero defect, I think uh, that will be a good system. But I'm sure that uh, a long way to go to achieve this perfection in education, because you're talking about a human transformation, according to me. If the product still people can do it, but I think in the human transformation, having a zero defect, uh, uh, I don't, I don't say it is a very idealistic situation, but very difficult to achieve. I can say, uh, but we put effort in this direction because our success, our survival is based on this only. Then the purposeful, so confirmation to state admission because we have also set a mission, the vision statements for the institutions, and are we purposeful in meeting what are the vision, the mission we have set, uh, which is included. The, in your own institution or by the accrediting body or by the regulatory bodies, whatever it could be. So there is a purposeful uh, in the quality framework which you have to take into consideration. Then it is transformative. Obviously, what happens? I am talking about a younger generation or a youth whom I am transforming through learning. So I am supposed to work in the areas of affective, cognitive and the psychometric domains for a student. So what is good in what student is very important here. And personal and professional potential. I should make him an ethical person and I should also professionally do a good job. I think this is a balance which you have to do, uh, which is uh, not so easy since we are talking about the humans. Then finally, achievements of distinction and exclusivity through fulfillment of high standards. Obviously, we are supposed to be benchmarked against the best institutions in the world. So that is the uh, quality framework uh, I can take for the education. And for each of the things, uh, if you look into accountable, for example, if you look into the accountable, what are the things I should look at? student preparedness for employment, procurement of the quality resources, sufficiency of the facilities, focus on the continuous improvement. So all these things could be measured actually. All these things could be measured. And uh, we definitely keep doing, there are a lot of metrics which I'm going to send a show at the end. And these are definitely accountable. And then purposeful. See, purposeful is something uh, which may not be totally uh, quantifiable. But at least I should have a combination of quantification and the quality aspects that to be taken into consideration. Fulfillment of the mission and the vision, transparent aims and processes, achievement of the standards, attainment of institutional goals. This is the purpose for which uh, any higher education students have to work. And credibility, exceptional thing is what? Credibility, legitimacy, reputation, ranking, and the prestige or the brand of the institution. This is also a part of the quality framework and transformative. Learner-centered approach. I think whole of our system has been called as a teacher-centric education system. Now I think we have to move for a learner-centered education system. And obviously, uh, uh, faculty plays a core. Uh, even though they say student-centric learning education system, I think the center is the faculty here. And the competency, because of the change in the technologies, what is happening in the world. In fact, today we call it a more Moore's law. Moore's law was every 18 months technology is to change. Now more Moore's law means uh, every 10 months technology keeps changing. Obviously, faculty also have to be upgraded. And if they don't transform, obviously every other factor in an institution is going to be affected. And there should also be a clarity of outcomes. What uh, your engineer is supposed to do after he does a electrical engineering, a mechanical engineering, we should have a clarity of the outcome in the beginning. Then obviously, everybody in the ex uh, company expects that uh, students should have a critical thinking. Then student engagement with content. I think. Uh, 
I, this is the whole uh, framework I can look into as part of the higher education uh, quality framework. And we will dissect one by one uh, as we go ahead in the slides. Obviously, so as per uh, UGC, as per our accreditation agencies, all these quality issues are taken through something called the internal quality assurance cell. And every institution will have this IQAC. Like you have a quality department in any organization, we'll also have IQAC cell in every institution. And this cell try to look into all the facts, whatever I showed in the previous slides, is going to look into the, all the facts and do all these kinds of activities, uh, identifying the best practices and comparing with where do we stand when compared with the other institutions. Doing the auditing, it could be the environmental audit, it could be gender audit, it could be the examination audit, it could be academic audit. I think a lot of audits have come nowadays. I think we have to meet all these certification things also. Could be building audit, could be fire audit. So many activities are there when it comes to administration also. So all these things finally will be taken care by and uh, uh, finally consolidated through a you know, quality assurance cell. And further steps to be taken is given through this cell. Governance and leadership is another important aspect. Then implementation of policies. I am sure we are good in making policies, but somebody has to monitor that now so that it has become a procedure, a budget has been done and it has been implemented. So this uh, uh, whole job, whether it has been done correctly or not, is taken care through IQAC cell. The teaching learning process, I threw it to the examination and the academic audit it is taken care. Environmental sustainability, that means meeting the sustainable development goals is also one of the important parts of the national education policy. And I'm going to show you what we are doing in the institution. Research uh, is very important. I think uh, many people say that uh, uh, academics research, what is important, whether two has to be done together, it could be done in isolation. So let me tell you, academics and research are the two faces of the same coin, and we cannot escape through this. Academics will, uh, uh, your understanding of the fundamentals will help, and the research will help you back again to do a newer things in the same area, whatever you are working with. So, and it will also be helpful for your academics in a better way to teach a student in a better way. I, you should take this as the two faces of the same coin. And what all the academic research activities we do will be considered here. Then facilities and resources, obviously total infrastructure and the services also have to be monitored from time to time. Then feedback from stakeholders. We feel that whatever we are doing is right, but the feedback from a parent, a student, we have a 360 degree appraisal in the institution. Uh, we use a SAP software for that and all the feedback you are going to get it and consolidate and see what are the improvements which are to be made. This feedback will be helpful for the continuous improvement. And we also had to do student support system and help the student in the co-curricular activities. So these are all the quality assurance initiatives uh, which are done in the higher education institutions. Obviously, I'm sure all of you would be knowing. We have, we have also like your industry, like uh, the kinds of uh, accreditation we have to meet. We also have accreditation ranking frameworks and uh, these frameworks uh, many times uh, uh, operate at the national level, also at the international level. Let's say we have the QS ranking, we have the BRICS ranking, and at the international level we have. And at the national level we have NIRF ranking. And at the accreditation we have NBA and NAC. And there are ISO 9000 we have. And there are other agencies which let us say, for industry survey, ACT and CIA does a survey for us. And then QSI gates for private institutions in the country we have. Like this, we are all a part of a good institution in the country, is a part of all these kinds of exercise of accreditation and the ranking framework. And this is very important uh, to project ourselves. And this indicates that uh, the quality of whatever is we are providing in the institution is depicted through these rankings. So fundamentally, if you look into the ranking frameworks, uh, they look at uh, five uh, things, whatever I explained to the quality framework and also through my supply chain, whatever I have done now, finally has to land up with academics, research, industry connection, consulting, institutional outcomes and the student benefits. I think these are the five important aspects of any education institution for the ranking purpose. If you take uh, the QS ranking, world ranking, the percentage is given by these agencies are different, that's all. Other than that, the uh, parameters they are taking is safe. For example, QS gives 40% uh, for the academic reputation, whereas the D ranking gives uh, teaching learning 30%. NRF ranking also gives teaching learning and resources 30%. So like this, uh, but the fundamental thing is everywhere you have to meet the requirements. And uh, if you want to be one in 100, one in 50, I think your quality of your institution is not good. I don't think you can go anywhere near these kinds of the rankings. I'm very happy to indicate that uh, our college is 96 in the overall ranking in the country. 
there are almost around 1500 institutions and the universities in the country participate and we are 96 in the nrf ranking we are not still gone to qs ranking d ranking we stand somewhere around 1500 in the world 1900 institutions and the universities have participated we are 1000 overall engineering 1000 and computer science related rank we are 8000 as per the d ranking which has been announced very recently also so this shows uh, the whole of the quality of the institution and if you are not a part of this i can go on climbing i am very good but somebody should recognize that that's where these ranking frameworks plays a very very important role so again i told you that uh, uh, one side is the ranking parameters academics research industry connect and consulting support to faculty student benefit these are the ranking framework and the institutional processes are these things which i've already explained in the supply chain management uh, model so now our job is to look into where to fit what I think this mapping is very dynamic in nature, actually. It keeps on changing. Even the parameters of the accreditation ranking parameters are changing every now and then. So mapping this is, this is very important, and the execution will be the next path. So I put uh, these things in a different way, that's all. But uh, this slide is very important as far as the mapping is concerned. Because every year, as a continuous improvement, I should keep on improving in every parameter. I'm going to show the metrics, then you'll realize that the Delta X improvement has to happen every now and then in an institution. Otherwise, we are not a part of these uh, ranking uh, frameworks. Then, uh, uh, even before going for a ranking, accreditation and assessment becomes very important. So, we have uh, two national agencies. NBA is a program accreditation. Let us say they give a specific to a program. I have mechanical engineering, I have electrical engineering, I have uh, civil engineering. NBA gives program specific accreditations. NAC is a national and institutional level kind of a accreditation and assessment council. And uh, this is given for the institution. And ABET is an American uh, board of engineering and technology, which is the international uh, kind of an accreditation process. Uh, why these things are needed is because India is also a part of a Washington account, where uh, NBA is a uh, accreditation agency for that. And uh, these kinds of ABET, NBA would be needed for the international mobility of the student. Let us say a student has studied some five courses here in my college. I am NBA accredited. My college is ABET accredited. Then he can get an admission to some ex university in America. And there these courses are there means he is going to get an exemption of those courses. I think that the straight meaning I can link with this kind of accreditation. This is a benefit as a student and an institution is going to get if you want to go for the accreditation. And whatever is given in the blue, no, these are all the parameters as for NBA. What are the given things which are given in red? is for NAC. What is the other color we have given is for the ABET. And I'm sure that many things, even though the terminology looks different, but the intention is same. And uh, this is the exercise we keep on doing almost six months every year uh, for providing all such kinds of data with respect to the vision, mission, the program education objectives, curricular aspects and the students, then program curriculum, teaching, learning, and the program education objectives in some other parlance because some people will try to link everything together. Some people uh, give more weightage to that. Then research and innovation, student outcomes, student performance, infrastructure, and uh, I I'm sure I have explained all these words already to do in uh, quality framework, as well as in supply chain model. So those models will be working here very effectively and uh, uh, program assessment and the institutional assessment could be done from time to time. Recently, we have got uh, six years, they give a uh, NB accreditation program is either for three years or six years. Recently, we have got uh, six years for five of our programs uh, in the institution. So this is a continuous process. And every three years or six years, we keep on doing this exercise. This is the sixth factor, seven, eight, nine. So for some, for example, uh, if you take uh, the uh, NAC, they have only seven criteria. And if you take uh, uh, the uh, NBA, they have a 10 criteria. If you take ABET, they have only eight criteria. I think that's so. But the initial intention is that maybe in NPA, they might have uh, uh, split into further subcategories, but some other things might have been added into the other categories. That's the only thing. Other than that, all the educational process, whatever we have, has to be uh, ranked or accredited through these criteria. And each of these criteria will have also sub criteria. As it is there in IS 9000 clauses and the sub clauses, we also have it here. And uh, so that is how the whole accreditation in the ranking framework happens. 
this is the ranking framework which i was talking about nrf qs ranking and the d ranking they have a ranking framework are little bit slightly different because they look at only the uh, consolidated kind of a view in the ranking whereas in the accreditation they go into the details of the things when once you are accredited getting the ranking going to ranking framework is also uh, easier otherwise without accreditation you want to go for the ranking it will be very difficult because you may not have the processes which are set for you please set the processes correctly then automatically these things are going to become easier of course there is a lot of competition here just just like uh, you have a apple and a samsung competition in the market for a product here also we have a x institution a y institution z institution all of them will be competing every year for these ranking and uh, getting the higher ranks obviously quality becomes an inherent characteristic in all this ranking and accreditation framework and if i don't maintain the quality i am sure uh, we will not be there in the race it's as simple as that so this is uh, about how can we link the quality i am going to take two examples today on looking into academics and research institutions for enhancing the quality all the other functions according to me are going to become the support functions but academics and research if i can try to tune it then things are going to become very easy so looking into the accreditation and the ranking frameworks over a period of time what we have done in acad achieving academic excellence i am going to spend some time then i am going to look into the research then to the metrics and then finally will be the summary i think that will be the next kind of speech i will have so as you know that when i am setting a syllabus when i am making a scheme i should always look into what an engineer and a manager is expected for the 21st century this is given by the global uh, economy so obviously i look into the foundation literacy should be there competences in the core area of competence should be there then the character building for a leadership quality should be there these are the 16 characteristics actually which has been defined by the world economic forum so let us say go back now these are the skills needed for a student go back and see how i have to incorporate these things in the curriculum and how it has to be taught is it only a part of the curriculum or i have to add lot of other things for him to build a better uh, skilled person into the market so this 21st century skills is one thing we keep in mind whenever we frame the curriculum design and the planning we do we keep this in mind like say critic these are called as four c's then the literacy is and also the leadership qualities these things have to be considered uh, when a student is going through the whole of the academic process then as you told outcome based education because uh, by and large i am sure that many places is output based education we look into the results only but uh, whatever he is supposed to do is in a position to do it let us say an electrical engineer how well he does uh, if there is any problem in his house any electrical issues can he solve it or is still waiting for electrical supervisor so obviously if he is waiting for electrical supervisor is an output based education if he himself goes back and repairs that he is an outcome based education it's as simple as that i'm giving the simplest of the example if he doesn't do that i'm sure that uh, the uh, whole process of education is not taught in that so that's how the outcome based education as per the washington accord uh, i think has been defined like this it should be outcome based education then the curriculum should have be there where the outcome has to be defined then your teaching learning should also be outcome based and your assessment should also be outcome based i think this uh, we have been following at least in our college from 2012 onwards and we have come to some level in all these things i don't say everything we have achieved it's a work in progress and uh, this has yielded lot of results of the going to the outcome based education one biggest problem we face where the innovation has to be applied is that ours is a rote learning i am sure uh, you are all listening to me now that whatever the talk i am giving is a one way communication i am sure even in classes for more than 100 years it has happened like this but there are 100 students in a class and uh, the way everybody understands is different so have you put some effort in understanding the learning style of a student this has been beautifully done in primary education actually in montessori education has been done but somewhere in the higher education this has not been done so can you classify students uh, under this category because he has some uh, uh, way of uh, learning things somebody may be learning mathematics only through practice if you directly teach a theoretical mathematics uh, it will not go into head but how to make him understand mathematics maybe through some experiments maybe through some modeling you can come from the reverse side and try to learn so like this the learning styles is one more important thing it may not be possible for you to do in every class but at least in some classes some internship some project we are making a group of students in a project now i think you can look into who are active listeners what are their strengths you can look into that 
otherwise you put one fellow who is not good in communication ask him to do a presentation he will utterly fail but ask him to do an experimentation he may do better so that is the strength so it's always better instead of looking to only the weak points of the students try to see what are the strengths and try to teach through that methodology i think it is going to have a lot of value so it's high time that in higher education we should look into these learning styles so that the quality of learning for him becomes higher otherwise uh, we'll be always having the blame game of uh, he's a good student he's a bad student uh, he doesn't come to class he comes to class i think our classification has to be entirely changed which has been there for quite some time so learning style becomes very important for a student if he has to do a uh, your uh, quality learning has to happen these styles have to be taken into consideration next another important uh, thing is very interesting actually as per uh, the washington akar there is something called the bloom's taxonomy which is very very popular in education the left side is uh, the bloom's taxonomy right side i'll come to it after some time so what happens is whole of our first three no remember understand apply i am sure in the last 70 80 years only this we have done in education these are all called as a lower order skills higher order skills are analyze evaluate and create that is what is expected today in the competitive market it could be a startup to be a new product it could be a new process so in education by and large we are in the mode of memorization remembering understanding and few places it is applied also but uh, Uh, analysis evaluation creation stage has to improve a lot higher order skills have to be developed in students if you want to move to the higher level of developing a product making indigenous products i think the next three levels are very important so uh, this is all you do a total mapping even in the syllabus as in the examination how much of remembering percentage is there how much of creative percentage is in your examination in the project is what we are looking for in the last one decade in many of the institutions in the country and as per that do you think uh, faculty has to change or not i don't know whether we are gurus or teachers i think uh, we have to debate this this is a separate uh, area altogether as for our indian knowledge system also if you teach uh, just given information to a student you become an adhyapak you impart knowledge combined with information you become upadhyay and uh, the one who imparts skills becomes acharya the one who is able to give a deep insight into the subject becomes a pandit and uh, the one who has a visionary view on a subject and teaches you to think in that manner become uh, drishta and uh, the one who is able to awaken wisdom in you leading you from darkness to light becomes a guru you can see even though it may not be a exact mapping with the bloom's taxonomy levels at least at the gross level i think what is expected in a creation is done by a guru what is uh, the facts giving is done by an adhyapak so this line we are trying to work out actually uh, at different levels because we have almost 350 faculty i can classify the faculty under all these category actually but our objective is to do what we test to go to the next level whatever level he is there he has to move to the next level so that the learning of a student uh, becomes very very important so this is a bloom's taxonomy which you have been following for quite some time and uh, we are getting good results because of this and the enhancement of the quality in teaching learning is also happening through this then uh, uh very interestingly that uh, i think corona has taught us uh, our ict tools even uh, digital taxonomy has come today uh remembering understanding applying analyzing same uh, uh, taxonomy but the kind of tools you are using could be bookmarking copying highlighting searching these are all the it tools which talk about digital tools so creation stage is what filming blogging podcasting direction these are all the higher order skills you need so uh, because today we talk about a hybrid education that means you have online as well as offline in all the higher education institution ugc is expecting us to go for 40% online and 60% offline mode obviously if you don't try to look into the quality of all this uh, digital uh, tools and the way students are learning the way faculty is teaching then uh, it will be a chaos according to me so obviously these tools also have to be taught in the right way and you should also know where what kind of a tool has to be made use of so as you rightly found out apart from teaching this active learning techniques play a very important role in achieving the academic excellence uh, it's not just a one way communication there are uh, many things which you can do in the class you know many of these things we are also following in the classes of the many good institution uh, by the way let me tell you i'm not just representing rv college of engineering i'm representing the whole of the higher education particularly engineering and i have collected many of these data from good institutions in the country 
and uh, these are the things which are happening people who are not doing i think and try to imitate this so that uh, uh, the results and outcome would be much better so we have certain active learning techniques like say polling then think pair share then verbal quizzes in the class debating and brainstorming the classes games and role play in the classes can be done it cannot be a separate extra curricular activity it could be a part of the academics and problem based and project based learning could be a part of the whole of the things because here we talk about the psychometer technique psychometer as well as the cognitive part of the mind we talk about it so uh, we should try to link this with active learning methodologies i will not go into details skill is a very very important thing today because uh, there is a statement called a uh, skill is to handle certainty and knowledge is to handle uncertainty so in education system let me tell you still i focus more on the knowledge even the skill is very much essential as of now we are somewhere around 30 70 that means 30% skill and 70% knowledge because if i give a knowledge uh, it will be a lifelong learning and will be helpful to him if i teach only python today and if his logic is not right python may not be there tomorrow in the market so skill is essential to meet the certainty and the present and the short term requirements knowledge is required for a lifelong learning and a lifelong leading a life in a better way knowledge is definitely essential if your computer logic is very good you learn through knowledge then python r programming matlab let uh, in the market let it change since your logic is good you can try to analyze any kind of a problem so problem analysis skills is more important uh, problem analysis is very important to me apart from the skill these are the first year skill labs and these are the based on the type of branches uh, we have different kinds of skills which you are supposed to develop in students and uh, when you are doing all this thing do you think you can do individually there are individual brilliance i think there is in cricket they say no sometimes they used to say this but it's not true as of now they say india is a team of champions and australia is a champion team they used to say the difference is that uh, we may have highest uh, uh, wicket takers we may have highest run getters but uh, we may not have won many matches but uh, whereas some other countries they small small they score and they win the matches i think that has reversed today in the indian cricket as such because we are also have a team work and individual players both are bad so team work plays a very important role if you want to execute all these kinds of skill development in a better way active learning in a better way looking into outcome based because the peer learning and a team work is very much important in the things and uh, i think this is very very important the peer learning and the kind of uh, uh, people we work with depends on a beautiful way vivekananda has put it the rain drop uh, drops from the sky correct if it is caught in the hands is pure enough for drinking if falls on the gutter its value drops so much that it can't be used for washing the feet if it falls on the hot surface it perishes if it falls on the lotus leaf it shines like a pearl and finally if it falls on the oyster it becomes a pearl the drop is same but its existence and worth depends on with whom it associates i think to this a beautiful statements and association and teamwork is very very important for today because uh, you have to measure everything on a time scale today and if you want to work on a time scale i feel that teamwork which gives a better results a synergistic approach gives a better result according to me and this kind of a uh, characteristics are to be inculcated in the younger generation if you want to look at a quality in whatever works they do of course uh, all of us know that uh, teamwork is better for all if you fight individually i think that's what is happening that uh, we, there is a scarcity of resources in some place there is excess of scarcity in other place because of the fighting of the states uh, or with the people uh, i think we cannot achieve much today i think teamwork is always better for all this has been depicted with this uh, diagram so obviously as i have already told you the education uh, kind of a thing is there and uh, education 4.0 advocates on a personalized learning because ict involvement is more today because of the uh, introduction of your googles and chat gpts lot of information is already available but how to channelize that information and uh, make students sure to learn in a self directed way is the essence of the education 4.0 and it could be anytime anywhere personal flexible delivery peers and mentors are very very important today uh, in terms of any field you take there is a lot of need for the mentors the practical applications modular and a jigsaw puzzle of learning and student ownership and evaluated and not examined examination system has to be entirely revamped that's how the uh, education 4.0 works hybrid learning is the order of the day uh, liberal uh, 
the offline part of it and the online part of it both has to be combined that is a challenge in the education today how much of online offline has to be balanced what should be the learning mix model is the one which every faculty has to work actually otherwise uh, uh, wherever it has to be online if you do online offline wherever it is offline if you do online i think the purpose would not be served and outcome not be achieved and uh, as a part of the uh, national education policy it has been felt that in particularly the engineers or the professionals uh, they are lacking in the art part of the whole of the life they are very good in engineering and technology but uh, if they can understand the art part in a better way i am sure there will be holistic engineers for example a person who does a product design i don't know whether he has studied anthropology and anthropometry but still he is doing the product design anthropology becomes very very important for you to understand what type of customers what is the legacy they have what should be the height and the weight all the measurement needed for the human is needed to do a product design but we find that it is all done in silos cognitive psychology to human computer interface or human human interface to do workstation design of the software whatever is given in the left part of it is the art part of it what is given in the right part is the engineering the technology part of it aesthetics to shapes and forms to product design sports and games to technology to design of the equipments and the accessories then the technology to experience and learning to the social learning history to sociology to public administration civil engineering to architecture and to the new structures bio inspired engineering very interesting we have found nowadays people are not studying biology students who join engineering you find out from them in the country 90% of them would not have studied biology they think okay it's needed for medical field actually they are forgetting whole of the lot of the products and the process developed in the engineering is only bio inspired it could be a artificial intelligence algorithm it could be artificial neural networks it could be genetic algorithms it could be cobweb models it could be ants colony algorithm it could be swarm intelligence all these things have been derived from biology and the bio inspired nature nature inspired things have been done so this has not been taught to the people correctly i'd like to give a beautiful example here when japan did a bullet train when they did a bullet train there is a sharp corner in the front and when they did the sharp corner um there should be lot of noise when it is moving in a high speed and the people around that place used to complain and one engineer wanted to reduce this noise and uh, he was uh, looking into uh, one bird which has a sharp corner and it is moving and diving into the water without making a noise and that he took as the philosophy and then redesigned the bullet train that is the bio inspired things which are to uh, teach all these engineers and managers so that if you can get connected with the nature already lot of solutions are there so that's the way the liberal arts part could be engaged with the engineering and technology so that the quality of learning and the quality of products what we develop in the market would be much higher this is a path you can create instead of having a silo subjects we can always have a, a continuity of the subject i am interested in robotics start from first year use a design thinking approach convert into a mini project convert into a main project i think this 23 credit course in 4 years will definitely you can make a product according to me and you can incubate and you can do a startup i think this path has to be set up by everybody so that uh, from the idea generation till the product or the process development it will be helpful to make them a better engineers in particular of course this could be applied for other fields like uh, doctors also in the management area every professional area these things would be applied we have identified uh, i am not going to details of this i am sure prabhakar may uh, call me now or interfere i will not go into details but uh, i am going to share all these slides with isq and anybody would like to work on this can look into it experiential learning methods in our college we have identified 49 to 50 experiential learning methods it could be the course segmentation in terms of the seminars the research topic literature review seminar videos case study building innovative methods could be on any software development open ended experiments design thinking approach virtual experimentation idea thons hackathons are a part of the course today and similarly you have industry institution symbiosis survey on a topic in a specific course could be done sectoral studies could be done industrial visits and converting that into a report could be done then uh, survey and startups in a specific course could be done because there are a lot of learning which happens in all those things so that the quality of learning will also be improved through these things liberal arts can i have a debate in a strength of materials class is the one which i have to look into we feel strength of materials is always the problem solving but can i have a debate in this 
it is possible i think there's the innovation which you have to work with so liberal arts could be linked with the whole of science and technology and the co curricular activities whatever is done by a student could also be a part of a credit so that uh, the learning otherwise now we call it is extra curricular activities actually there's nothing like extra curricular activity today if you want to bring a holistic education it should be a part of the curriculum and should be a co curricular activities according to me these are the experiential methods we have identified so that uh, a proper learning happens in the student then research is very important as i already told you research and uh, academics are the two faces of the same coin like a shadow and light are the two sides of the same coin one cannot exist without the other and uh, interdisciplinary research is the order of the day as you know that research happens in a disciplinary silos from disciplinary we have to move into multidisciplinary and then to the interdisciplinary nature and to the transdisciplinary nature if you go to the highest level now it is not individual circle a societal problem today a traffic problem a waste disposal problem is not in silos you need an engineer you need a administrator you need lot of other departments to solve a social problem so transdisciplinary all the higher level synthesis that the, the social kind of a problem would be transdisciplinary in nature and the, are we building these kind of a skills or the nature in research based learning in students is the one which is going to define the quality of education actually if you are not done all these exercises then in silos he keeps working and if somebody talks about interdisciplinary nature because today we have a left eye specialist and a right eye specialist but there are people who work in all these areas jagdish chandra bose from india is the best example he has worked in the area of radio and microwave optics then he made a significant contribution in the plant science and he has built the foundation for the experimental sciences how many areas are there in this so if people say that interdisciplinary is very difficult you can keep this as the role model and start working in interdisciplinary nature because if i take a robot today actually robot has all the branches of engineering and all the branches of arts is also there in that so obviously we cannot see things in silos we can also look into how to build the centers of excellence because this is going to be ecosystem which has to be developed if research has to be inculcated uh, better in the market so it could be identifying the thematic areas assigning the right teams developing modules and importing training in the research areas leveraging the knowledge base then executing the as per the standards the work then periodical review and follow up of the activities and this cycle continues uh, in the centers of excellence then what cannot be measured cannot be improved i'll very quickly browse through it if you look into the performance indicator in terms of the academics target versus actual score which is given by let us say out of 1000 marks how much you have got how much you are supposed to get is the first measure of performance you can look into it then improvement over the last 3 years then the committee's effectiveness i have more than 30 committees committees in the college what the timeliness complaints defaults all these are the measurement system you can have then the quality of student projects then the class timing saving due to blended learning modes then revenue earned from skill development and executive development programs number of international university tie ups student feedback score on teaching these are the aspects of performance indicators we can keep for the academics as for the research is concerned number project value conversion rate of research proposals total value of research projects percentage of funding from external stakeholders coverage of faculty and the collective royalties received coverage of ug pg students and doctor students the coverage of identified trust areas for research target versus actual number of phds ongoing and completed number of publications in the very good peer reviewed journals number of academic events hosted number of patents student feedback score on the research is for the research then for uh, industry connects number of industry partners value of industry funding number of patents shared with industry revenue from lab support revenue from consulting number of uh, mentorship programs number of startups incubated average idea to launch time number of collaborative events to promote startup uh, uh, support it could be pitch contest idea forums and etc and then uh, support to the faculty because this becomes a crux of the whole of the education system what is the phd what support has been given conversion rate to research proposals because if i write for 50 crores of projects what is the conversion rate is very very important for me that shows the quality of the faculty actually if conversion rate is 50% today i think it is a very good the uh, uh, quality of a faculty and the work whatever is doing the number of industry connects so like this you can also measure to support the faculty then uh, the institutional outcomes in terms of the alumni relations and the global initiatives 
number of industry partners alumni associations outreach activities then how well you are there in the digital and social media then uh, what is the funds raised to support harness from the alumni then national and global academic partnership we have number of students benefited through these outreach initiatives is a measurement uh, in terms of the alumni relations and the global initiatives the people process technology as, as i already told you in my supply chain uh, uh, management uh, diagram all those things are taken here and everything should be measured hr training effective index as you do in the companies here also i have to train my faculty and what is the effectiveness of that uh, training program to look into marketing and the media plan we have certain uh, uh, kind of uh, parameters of course accreditation has got the best number systems are there then the feedback scores from the student parent and the stakeholder of course the nac score is anyway there and admission timeliness and effectiveness of admission and the database management of that is one of the performance indicators and the quality of admission is also very important then uh, with respect to finance finance is uh, similar to what you do in the industry we also do in the organization in terms of the budget then the purchases the procurement the analysis the variance analysis also we do and see how uh, uh, these things have to be improved over a period of time then stores then the library hostels and the administration these are all the other outcomes you are going to look for then the student benefits could be placement number of academic tie ups number of uh, international uh, students industry tie ups journal papers by students patents filed by students technological contests co curricular activities student benefited across all the initiatives these are all the student benefits we are trying to look for in order to do this you also need a e governance where in uh, in our college what all the functions have told many of these functions have already been computerized we will go with sap software all these modules whatever you do in the industry is also there this is ensuring the quality of my work in all the administration whatever i'm doing also trying to crunch the time of the administration see that uh, the faculty spend more time on the research on the academic part that is where this kind of a sap sort would be helpful in the organizations and in the higher education institutions also and finally let me end my uh, last slide that uh, final whole of the education system what we talk about uh, finally has these outcomes employment potential to improve obviously there's a fundamental purpose then better accreditation and ranking at the national international levels because it is our survival actually and then holistic education has to be given rather than education in silos for better living it's not just for the job if you look into lifelong learning you should also have better living no the quality of living should be very good that is done through holistic education then enhancing your publication patent building incubation centers and the startups is the order of the day for survival i think all these things have to be done then of course deliver a product in collaboration with the universities and the industry contributing to sustainable the growth of the nation i think all these things will finally lead to this some things are long term here some things are short term then finally we have a onus in the education system to inculcate the nationalistic spirit and also made in india culture as per the latest provisions made and finally to make india as a international knowledge hub and make a developed nation i think there are uh, short term goals here or the outcomes to be achieved medium and the long term uh, uh, outcomes to be achieved i think if these things are done i am sure that the quality in higher education has been taken care according to me and uh, this is my last slide i hope uh, i not confused people i have put uh, the quality perspective on uh, higher education how the things are happening and what we are supposed to achieve and there is long way to go actually uh, in achieving because uh, there are lot of heterogeneity we have more than 6000 or 20000 institutions some hundreds of universities and if you want to reduce the variance and bring back all those things i am sure it takes lot of time maybe if you can take uh, another uh, uh, 20 to uh, another 15 years to 20 years i think the situation in the country has to definitely improve in fact it is already predicted that in the next one decade we should at least get uh, three to four nobel prizes from india alone i think if that kind of a thing happens i am sure that the higher education institution will be contributing to the country in a better way in terms of the capacity building of the students also in terms of the economic growth and also one more term actually people is called as happiness index i think i don't think i have mentioned anywhere a long way to go to achieve that because our quality of life at the end of the day is very important that's what our education is to provide to all the people uh, particularly the youth in the country i think this where i'm going to stop uh, thank you very much and i given a qr code
if somebody wants to know about what rvc is all about you can just uh, go the qr code if you uh, scan through your mobiles you'll get the brochure of my college and it will also lead to the my college website and if anybody would like to get connected with our institution we'll be very very happy as a part of isq also we are trying to start a student chapter in the college so that we'll try to enhance uh, inculcate the quality characteristics that very engage for the students so that when they go back to the industries uh, they'll do a better job uh, rather than uh, uh, not looking into quality but still performing the things i think that will not uh, meet the requirements of the industry so with this note once again thank uh, even though i am a part of isq let me thank all my seniors ramanathan and janatsa and also mauli and prabhakar all these people for giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts let me spend some more time on uh, with all of you in uh, enhancing uh, our uh, quality journey and uh, try to see that how can we or uh, try to help uh, people in the society and make things in a better way so i hope i conveyed the message thank you very much and i'll be happy to have some questions to be taken thank you very uh, much <clears throat> yeah thank you dr subramanya it's a wonderful session quickly uh, we will ask uh, janak mehta sir uh, to deliver some 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 something from him my congratulations and compliment for such a comprehensive uh, presentation in little over an, almost an hour you've covered such a vast ground it's really been so happy to hear all this so i don't want to spend too much time except one suggestion is that we have a anq congress in 2025 sometime around november december we have two years japan typically comes out with 30 40 papers by the professors the university faculty and the students they mostly phd students who are working toward the quality thesis if we can come out with five such six such papers in uh, 2025 we have two years to go i think you would have made a very important contribution providing an opportunity for the professors as well as the participant present something which the japanese keep doing it all the time koreans do it they wonder that but japan uh, 50 people will normally participate presentations made we have a number of presentations from indian industry but maybe five if we can target from the academia along with their students it's invariably a combination the professor along with the the student who is working on certain projects and they have to actually present the projects what they have completed that could be a good way to make a impact asia wide and then international good sir i think uh, i'll take this uh, challenge i'll make sure that five papers are there i'll talk to all the people in the education sector and see the best paper go for the conference i'll make sure of that sir great and we get five paper five, five different colleges or university that will be yeah, good yeah 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 sure so definitely definitely yes thank you very much compliments thank you thank yeah you, thank you janak uh dr subramanya you have done excellent uh, project and uh, you have presented your uh, project report today there are going to be a viva sessions now it's going to start okay uh, the first question is going to be how are you going to evaluate or audit the performance of process oriented approach source process output actually uh, i have already defined the processes uh, as for the quality framework and also as per the part of the supply chain framework okay and uh, finally i have also given the metrics for each of these processes i think it is directly i have already given that and if somebody wants more details on that how it will be done i think it is a total uh, calculation numbers everything will come there but the main metrics i have already given for all these processes i it is mapping also whatever i talked about academic research all those mapping with the metrics is also there so thank you is already given mm. some more somebody needs more of a thing i can always get it yeah uh, and there is a, the second question iso uh, 21001 uh, do you have any thoughts uh, this question is asked by prashant oh uh, no as of now i don't have the right information there maybe uh, some because uh, uh, many institutions may not have gone for iso actually frankly speaking very few institutions have started with iso 9001 uh, but uh, Uh, we are not still the big is 14000 few institutions have gone uh, but uh, as of now is 20000 i don't because uh, 
uh, i think i i remember that uh, one of our uh, uh, mc member is talking about that it's on the environment innovation all such kind of things i think we have to work a little bit more if you want to go for that certification according to yeah uh, thank Suggestion you Dr. professor Kupar. don't worry about iso standards you have your own standard you're not okay. trying to do too many things your own accreditation boards and standards if we do that well and if we stay centric to what you have the matrices you suggested i think uh, that's what matters the international ranking is the what matters iso 9000 so many institutes will get okay sir that's my perspective okay sir thank you sir thank you uh, dr subramanya there is a second uh, third question when you compare tax money of uh, students and teachers permits uh, what are the direct correlation you arrive actually i have already given that uh, uh, that uh, table that triangle shows that directly because uh, as you know that uh, the first three levels what has been done even in my examination system no uh, we have a policy of if you write five pages uh, five pages i'll give 10 marks or 20 marks i think that is the fundamental thing which has to go away because as you go higher up the hierarchy the number of pages uh, uh, lengthy answers will not matter idea should be given more importance i think this faculty have to understand this because uh, what happens is if i take a mathematical note they'll do three pages derivation for which anyway you have to work and memorize but instead of that if you can ask uh, in between steps there in between steps at the next level because if you are not understood the thoroughly the derivation he cannot answer the in between steps in mathematics so uh, we should try to check like that and uh, it is a clear mapping is that he is not just overflowing the information let let us see in one hour i done 51 slides sir. in every class if i go on doing this 51 slides i don't think anybody will listen also it could be only 10 slides but it should be more made more effective i think that's a message i want to convey thank you thank you doctor uh, the the next question is uh, what will be the new accreditation system as per nep 2020 maybe yeah. one of your professors have asked <laughs> okay okay actually it is going on uh, maybe the uh, framework uh, because the, you have nac at the institutional level np at the program level now i am also part of some committees there uh, things are going on maybe in december there will be a clarity on uh, already the draft the thing has been put i also request uh, a faculty members if they are here go back to the ugc website nba website already draft reports have been put you can give your input also if you want to make some changes maybe i am sure by january the final draft of how it look like is going to come uh, yes professor today the students are very obedient they don't want to ask more questions because generally if it is a industry related one people ask many more questions so now i request mahesh agde to conclude this session with a big thank thanking note she was a may i say something she was a may i say something you want to ask something yeah Yeah, uh, my my basically observation to Dr. Janak Mehta and uh, Dr. Subramanya both. Uh, Dr. Subramanya made a great presentation, which was really educational to us. Uh, but at the same time, if at all I will look at basically the RV RVCE, which has created their own system, which is a world class. Probably it's a great thing now. But if at all I talk to Dr. Janak Mehta in that case now, how this system is going to be replicated in other educational organization? For that, we require a system. and that's why i was trying to ask the question of regarding the uh, dr supermanes views about the iso 21001 which is all about, about the education systems only so i'm just trying to basically understand uh, that if at all we need to propagate this type of system into other education organization are every professor is going to create their own stand alone system or they are going to look into certain international issues in that case now uh i mean any one of you can answer that question correct say actually let me tell you now uh, because of this online kind of an education system uh, what has happened is you have a nptel repository if you take the academics in the courses per se you have a nptel repository which has been done by iit and uh, other professors and i'm sure in the country almost all the institutions uh, students are going to study that material only so there is some standardization which is already happening even in that may not be for all courses but uh, as per ugc as i have already told you 40% we have to go on the online mode now that is the best teacher in the country who is going to teach we, which all the students are going to get a benefit out of it so that kind of a standardization is happening under the same time other kind of a standardization will happen 
only if the institutions work together i think uh, there is a big problem uh, between the institutions working together what happens is the kind of resources which are to be created common kind of resources is very important so if we can do that the commonalities could be done among the institutions otherwise as you are rightly pointing out it will be in isolation it will be happening yeah this is precisely is my observation yeah i mean yes. because a brilliant professor like you would like to create something like that but how it is going to be created in other organization is going to be depending on the brilliance of that person so if at all i have to eliminate that person from there i need to have a system for that and that's why i was looking for some system system implementation can be good it can be bad there is no doubt on that but definitely if there is a system we can go ahead with basically some some sort of a success with that i mean that was my observation thank okay. you very much thank you thank you sir thank you there is a student in mauli chandra he wants to give uh, some more answer for this question thank you uh, there's a prashant alankar uh, relating to what uh, mr chanak mehta said uh, we need to be a little careful when we talk about the standards that the standards uh, on one hand will put a framework but then they will also put a boundary and uh, this is a little bit uh, uh, bad towards creativity because if you want to be creative then you can't be in a framework so when something is getting evolved something is getting developed and experimented and tried out then the better uh, such uh, academicians and uh, practitioners who want to really you know, experiment and bring something new to the world have little bit of their uh, dwell time that uh, they are able to apply this and uh, try to know what is good uh, and then after several years usually the standards come up so even today many of the standards get revised once in 4 years or once in 8 years and the in between time is actually the learning time to go to the next level uh, otherwise if you keep changing the standards it's not good at the same time having a knowledge of all uh, 30000 plus iso standards what we have uh, and try to fit in where we how we go about including innovation standard uh, then you will be thinking more on the standard than the actual work itself so from that point of view i'm just relating what dr subramanya said and what uh, mr janak mehta also pointed out it's not that uh, a traditional quality organization is against uh, iso standards there is a lot of misconception that the japanese don't respect iso standards it's not that but uh, probably they don't restrict themselves to the iso standards and they want to do beyond that and go very very deep so the more to learn and um, th this is this is something uh, a different learning what we had today and thank you once again uh, dr kenis for this so just a clarification and uh, point from my side and not a question mm -hmm. thanks for the opportunity no, sinimas thank you moli um, thank you. this is your perception yeah. this is your perception absolutely no problem see prakash you need to understand standards prescribe the minimum requirements and excellent organization work way beyond the standards the best of the top 100 universities in the world do not follow iso 9000 standard each of each country based on its own need and that's how this nep has come up they are setting a whole system what is nep nep is setting a philosophy and a complete system it is not iso 9000 is a very restrictive approach in the sense it's only focused on certain aspect and doesn't look at the effectiveness if we look at the effectiveness 9 out of 10 organization won't get as on and on it's become a bane of uh, a promotional business thing of certification and standards bodies we shouldn't fall into that trap let's do well enough in industry before we start expanding to other institutions if you take the top 100 institution the top in institution of any country they don't necessarily follow as on and on thank you mr janak and uh, mahesh hegde it's your uh, last uh, big thanks thank you srini for this opportunity it's my honor and privilege to share some concluding remarks in the presence of quality guru mr janak mehta mr n ramanathan and uh, of course uh, experts like mr chandra mauli and you and uh, really it was enlightening session by dr k n subramanya with lot of insights uh, i was not knowing so many things about quality in the education field and it's amazing they say uh, they say mediocre teacher tells 
good teacher explains and great teachers inspires and uh, dr subramanya you have been inspiring uh, for everybody to focus on quality in higher education it was truly amazing just i want to sum up few of the points that i have uh, noted in this and uh, one of that you started with a statement by sri arbindo and he talked about holistic development of mind body soul and he also said that in the initial stage uh, in the early age it's important to focus on character building at young age and later on we need to work on uh, next level and i also saw that national higher education policy 2020 uh, vision document which has got such a detailed one it was a uh, wonderful learning that it has got four aspects and uh, you also shared about the thought process of quality gurus seven qc tools new tools and application of them uh, how important it is in the uh, education uh, in in the field of education and uh, you also spoke about a vision document of 2035 a very exhaustive document and industry of society disruption educational transformation nep 2020 which is you said 400 pages uh, document a detailed document and important uh, importance of developing 21st century skills and outcome based learning employment in higher education innovation strategy gen x gen z and uh, all these kind of uh, new things uh, we we got to know from this and very interestingly you also spoke about a supply chain model and uh, it was something new completely like you said source and service and delivery and in the source you spoke about uh, how it is important like tier 2 sslc 10th or primary education and you spoke about all the stakeholders when you talk about quality we talk about all the stakeholders i think you covered all the stakeholders when it comes to quality of education and quality framework for higher, higher education with uh, four points you talked about accountability and purposefulness transformation and uh, exceptional and uh, focus is on the learner and uh, that's what you spoke about and uh, later on quality assurance initiatives uh, iq ac cell various best practices audit certification governance and research and academics various such points there are so many points related to quality in education and uh, various ranking frameworks and you covered that framework so well about five points whether it's academic research industry connect or institutional outcome or students benefits and um, uh, various uh, assessment levels and accreditation assessments whether it's nba or nac or abet all these assessments and how important it is for students when they go to other country for the higher education and having such a, 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 that accreditation for the uh, college will improve the quality of their education and uh, various achievements and 21st century skills for uh, global economic characteristics that you spoke about then uh, another new thing i heard the digital uh, taxonomy where you spoke about uh, active learning there are so many ways for uh, active learning and focus on <laughs> knowledge <laughs> and kutkoli idna yello ikke meeting un nortta idini re mugito there is importance of knowledge and uh, skill and you said that 70% focus is on the knowledge like python can be a skill but it may be there today or tomorrow but uh, later on the knowledge that person gains that's important and the focus on the knowledge and uh, also uh, you quoted the statement by swami vivekananda about association and teamwork and about uh, rain drop you said that how important it is Uh, i remembered when you spoke about it one of the subhashita which, which says mahajana samsargasya kasyanno napi karakah padma patra sitam toyam datte uh, mufta palashrayam that means a drop of water when it falls on 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 the uh, you know lotus it it shines like a pearl the importance of that drop becomes uh, so much and you also told about various learning style uh depending on that you said in the in the lower education they worked on the various learning style and created various uh sensory based learning active and visual and such things and there is a need to develop such things in the higher education and um, how it is important 
right from starting from remember, understand, apply, and finally how we can have a creativity in that and um, uh, difference up to what is the meaning of guru, uh, various stages that you have covered very well. And uh, in fact, it was exceptionally well and so much of learning. I think we all truly amazed and mesmerized with the knowledge that you shared in the given time. And we'd be happy to learn much more about quality of education. And I'm sure with this kind of work done and if it is implemented in our industry, there'll be big transformation and it can really make remarkable impact on the industry going forward. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, over to you, Srini. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.